the, the, the kind of plan that we have is that the lovely Fiona Newborough from Bruin Dolphin will um, give some in, insightful and trusted comments about protecting your family in life with, through the use of investments. I will then talk about the importance of making a will and how you can protect your family in that way. And then the lovely Ryan Harrison from Levers will give us a lovely talk about the dark world of tax in the current climate. So it's exciting times for us this morning. Um, we'll all talk for about 15 minutes and then we'll have a question and answer session. So you will see at the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse over the bottom, there's a Q&A button. So if you have a question for us, you can just simply type it in there and it will come to the attention of um, Rob, who um, is part of Fiona's team, and to Ryan and myself, and we'll be able to answer the questions, whether or not through our own talks or at the very end, where we'll, we'll pick up any questions as best as we can. So I will um, therefore let Fiona go forward and give us her, her talk about investing. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Good morning, everybody, and um, and, and welcome for, on behalf of Bruin Dolphin um, to this slightly unusual uh, seminar slash webinar that we're, we're running today. Um, as Sam said, you know, we, we've decided to come together at this time because, uh, you know, we've all been worried about our families and, uh, and the health of our families and, and their well-being over the, 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 the recent weeks. However, to an extent, we can sometimes think neglect our financial situation. Um, so we thought it would be, be sensible just to highlight what's going on in our respective worlds. Um, just to give you a bit of background, um, I'm an investment manager at Bruin Dolphin. Um, I'm joined today by Rob Brotherton, who is a financial planner at Bruin Dolphin as well. Um, as a firm, Bruin has um, about 40 billion assets under management. It was slightly before, more before the, um, the crisis hit, uh, but actually we haven't been too badly hit as a result. Uh, we operate from 33 offices around the UK and Ireland, and we employ about 460 advisors uh, and many more support staff. Newcastle is actually one of the largest offices, and uh, we employ about 300 people in the Northeast. Um, so onto the main subject for today, we are talking about protection. And what does that actually mean when it comes to your finances? Well, some obvious points spring to mind uh, and, and areas that you'll no doubt have heard of before. These can be associated with insurance policies. So clearly COVID has made us think carefully about protecting our family from financial difficulties. It isn't just about savings investments for the long term. It's also about ensuring that your loved ones will be protected should anything happen to, to you or us. So we can protect ourselves um, from loss of income through illness or accident. There are policies in place that enable you to cover, have your income covered should you become ill or be unable to work. Now, the analogy that is often used for this is, is this idea that if you had a tree that grew in your garden that actually grew, grew money, you would do everything you could to protect it. And if you are the source of income generation for your family, it is really important to consider the way in which you could protect them. Another area which you may well have heard of is the protection, uh, protecting against a critical illness, um, obtaining a policy that enables you to, to cover any debt or obligations should you become diagnosed with a critical illness. Typically, the, typically these are known as uh, the, the, you know, cancer, uh, stroke, heart disease, um, but there are many, many others, but it will pro essentially provide you with a lump sum in that scenario. I'm afraid that there is a lot of talk about illness and death when it comes to, to finances, and, and Sam will certainly attest to that. Um, you know, we do spend a lot of our time talking about our own and our clients' demise, um, but it is a really important thing to consider. Um, so again, we can protect ourselves uh, financially from death uh, and, and put into place policies that will just make sure that our children or our, our loved ones are looked after in that event. So that there, there was there's some of the more obvious financial protection points that we would I was thinking of discussing today but actually what else might we have to protect our finances from? Well there's a real spectrum and actually one that, that springs to mind is, is sometimes we need protection from ourselves when it comes to our finances. That isn't to say that you are just going to squander all your own, your own assets and your own money. I, I'm not trying to suggest that any of us would be, um, 
would would do that but sometimes we can neglect our finances through inertia it could just simply be that it's too overwhelming for you to think about the idea of investments or or how to cope with lots of different financial products that are out there we may also need to protect ourselves from our own knowledge. Um, sometimes we come across clients, uh, in fact, all the time, who have, who have got a lot of their knowledge and experience, understandably, from their parents or grandparents. Now, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that in principle. It's always good to instill sensible financial education to the younger generations. However, times have changed very much so from the era that our, our parents and perhaps grandparents were beginning to invest. We now have really low interest rates, so we're not getting returns on cash. Um, there was a period in time where pensions weren't trusted. And so I quite often come across clients who say, oh, I don't want to touch pensions because I was told not to by my dad. He got stunned. So, so we do need protections from ourselves, from ourselves to an extent. After all, you don't know what you don't know. More and more, Bruin, uh, more and more at Bruin, we speak to people who simply don't know where to start with their, with their money. They, they, they've got their savings, they might have a pension plan somewhere, but they just don't know where to begin in terms of trying to get advice. So how can you protect your future financial plans without having a plan in place? Now, we've all got different objectives. We're not trying to suggest that everyone is, is saving for the same thing in the future or over the same time scale. But actually, it is really important to ensure that you consider your plan and, and consult an expert in the field. Not knowing where to start can instill a massive feeling of loss of control and security. This can have a, a real impact on mental health and as the worry of what we need to do and what we don't know how to do can give us sleepless nights and impact on your working life and home life. Financial well-being is something that as a firm we're striving to ensure people factor into their overall well-being and now during this crisis has never been a better time to consider it. Financial well-being could mean a multitude of different things to different people. Not, our, not all of our worries will be related to, will I have enough? Will my family have enough? It might simply be that a sense of, of order needs to be instilled, that you're feeling out of control and anxiety is building. Quite often we get clients who come in and say, I've got things everywhere and it's, 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 it's worrying me constantly. Uh, and actually, anecdotally, Rob and I had a meeting with a prospective client just last week who had retired recently. She was pretty organized, but she had ices all over the place. She didn't know what was in them. She didn't know really who owned them anymore because they'd been transferred from different company to different company over the years. And whilst we obviously talked about objectives and risk and, and you know, planning for the future, one of her main relief moments was when we said, we'll contact your providers for you and we'll find your ISAs and don't worry. And her response was, that's the best conversation I've had in a long time, which um, I'm not sure she was referencing our, uh, our scintillating conversation. I think it was just that build up of anxiety that she hadn't even appreciated was there. So that's what I mean about protecting yourself from yourself to an extent. I think we can all become really bogged down in, in, the, in, in the worry about tracking down old pensions, tracking down old ICEs, finding out whether you've got any insurance, finding out whether you've got income protection. It, it, quite often it's a case of just putting things in order. So when it comes to financial well-being, a lot of studies have been done that, that in, indicate that um, over 41% of people are concerned that the money they have now won't last. And, and actually, according to a study by the CIPD, one in four of us report that money worries have affected our ability to, to do our job properly. We don't leave our money worries behind us when we open up our laptops or start working for the day. And equally, 19% of us have lost sleep worrying about our finances. A change in our society has been, uh, been a huge cause of, of concern for many when it comes to our money. Rising costs of education and housing, pension reforms and the fact that we're all living longer can have, can have kind of created a perfect storm and mean that financial pressures facing people at work today are only likely to intensify. 
So how can how can we start to talk about protecting our financial futures? Well, we, we put a plan in place, but be prepared to deviate from it. We need to make sure that our plans are able to absorb a financial shock, whether that's something like uh, the roof falling in and you're having to very quickly find funds to replace it, whether it's a, an illness in the family, it is always good to, to review and re-review your plans. Many have often associated the world of wealth management as being inaccessible, using too much jargon and being somewhat intimidating. As a business, we recognise that massively that financial advice should be available to all. And we've worked really hard to develop services that actually do help um, the masses, to be honest. We, we were so often associated with being for the high net worth and, and we now have services that are available to, for investment from a thousand pounds. And it's really because we feel very strongly that the, the, the ethos of saving has to start early. And if you wait until you've already amassed a certain amount of money before you start investing, then it's already, you've already missed out on opportunities to protect against inflation. So I've digressed slightly, but the, the protection piece is, wo is woven into everything that we do for our clients. Um, we have to protect against this low inflation and, inf and, and interest rates, uh, inflation and low interest rates. So just anecdotally, a notional £100 deposit into a savings account in 2009 would have had a real value of only £84 by 2019 over 10 years. So that's a 16% fall and that's purely down to inflation. So obviously if you if you scale up that amount that you're keeping in a bank account for the future then the real returns that you're getting are, are negative. Uh, with a cash ISA with an interest rate linked to it that, that amount might have arisen to, to £114 um, or 14% rise. But if you had invested in the UK equity stocks and shares ISA, which is linked just to a tracker on the FTSE 250 in 2009, it would have grown to £314 from, from 100, assuming interest rates and dividend, interest and dividends were reinvested to benefit from the compounding and taking into account any fees for investments. So that's an increase of 214%. Now, obviously, we can't suggest ever that the past performance is a guide to the future, but over the long term, equities have been proven to outperform. Even if, and, and actually to relate the, the inflation piece to, to something more, more real to us, um, a smartphone back in 2008 would have set you back about £300 brand new. Now that is now costing about the equivalent of, of £999 in, in 2019 or now. Now that's an inflation rate of 234%. So if you're relying on your savings in cash to pay for things in the future, it's just not feasible. It's, it's, it's not going to add up. Um, so we need to protect ourselves from low interest rates uh, and inflation. But that is not to say that we shouldn't hold cash. Again, back to that protection piece, we always recommend you pr protect your short and medium term needs by keeping cash for emergencies available. Rob and I would always recommend that on the whole, you keep six months worth of your essential expenditure in liquid assets, but just don't expect a return from them. That way you're protecting yourself from short term volatility in the markets. And actually over the years, we've really, really tried to drill this into our clients with all our ongoing conversations about, have you got any upcoming commitments that you might need to cover? Have you got enough cash to cover them? Let's look at whether we should, we should look at raising cash now because no one wants to be a forced forced seller in the markets that we saw in March of this year. I'm really pleased to see that we have seen some recovery since then, but but it was a pretty tricky time to be an investor. And actually, um, back to that protection piece, many feel that they can go it al alone when it comes to investing. And, and lots of people have an interest in stocks and shares. And in a rising market, feel that they can pick the stocks and, and get a return. But actually where the expert advice really comes into its own is in volatile markets. Because although we understand your goals and objectives, we won't be emotional about the way we respond to markets. We will always make sure we don't make rash decisions and, and, and come out of, of, of stocks when, when they're at their, their lowest point. Yet it is often in the eye of the storm when it comes to the stock markets that we, we, we hear of investors cashing in because they can't cope 
with the volatility and that's understandable it's 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 your family and it's your life that you're protecting and therefore emotion can take over and that's where the experience of investing can really uh, reap rewards um, I had a, a, a few clients who were relatively new to investing they'd never experienced a, um, a period of volatility b before and and I, I spent a lot of time on the phone to them during that period uh, where we were seeing huge gyration on markets now I'm uh, uh, old enough to have lived through the dot-com bubble bursting, uh, the financial crisis, and I know how it feels to be working uh, in, in, in that environment. And, and actually, the, the communication with clients in between times is just as important as it is at, that, at those moments, because it is about instilling that idea of, of trust. And, and the knowledge that you have committed to a portfolio where you understand the risk and you understand your long-term goals. And actually, we spent an awful lot of time just going back to our clients and reminding them, if you don't need the money now, you can keep it invested. It's for the long term. And remember, you, you know, we talked about the level of risk you're taking. Everybody has different tolerances for risk. And we, we are very acutely aware of that at Bruin Dolphin. And we, we have a spectrum of different categories that we invest for people uh, because we know that there will be some people who become overly anxious when markets fall for very good reasons. And they just can't tolerate the, the falls associated with a pure equity portfolio. Now, we have seen some some great elements of recovery. Um, and, and actually, if if you had taken the decision to, to, to liquidate everything just at the bottom of the market, you would have missed out on that, um, that, that, that recovery. We, on a long-term basis, we always say that it is timing, timing the market, not timing the market. Um, it is impossible to come in and out and time the falls and, and the rises in markets. And, and just to put that in, into context, um, if you stay in the market for longer, you will reap the rewards. I have a chart um, here, actually, which shows the effect of missing the best 10 days of the UK stock market between 1986 and 2018. Now, an initial investment sum of 100,000, which I know is a lot, but obviously scale it back um, to give the, 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 the appropriate um, comparison. But 100,000 invested in 1986 with the benefit of compounding dividends, so you're reinvesting the returns all the time, um, would have been worth two mil over 2 million in 2018 if you had been on a pure equity portfolio and remained invested throughout. However, if you had missed just the best 10 days of those years, your investment would be worth half that at £1 million. That's just being out of the market for the 10 best days out of a 20-year period. Because the best days come after the worst. And so if you have jumped ship on the worst day, you will really miss out on those returns. And again, that is where the benefit of having a specialist or an expert involved in investment for you uh, is, is, is a protection. And, and it, it's really important to consider that when you are looking at your own investment. Um, the risk to your family's future security can be great if you take decisions without seeking advice. We do see situations where with the very best intentions your, our clients have, have, have saved for the future, whether that be through property or investments, but without taking advice they haven't taken advantage of tax planning and I know that, that Ryan will refer to this, but, but protection from, from tax is, is really key. We've, we've seen cases where huge assets have grown and grown and grown in value and a family then wants to, to pass down to the next generations and haven't been able to because without a, without a huge tax bill. Uh, if that, if the, those capital gains had been managed carefully over the years through the use of ISAs and, uh, and various and, and use of capital gains tax allowances, then we could have managed those gains for them. Um, so it just goes back to that idea that it is always important uh, to protect yourself from yourself sometimes, um, to, to, just to just to sense check. Sometimes it is a case of coming in, having a review and, and for us saying, do you know what? Everything is in order. You're doing a really good job. Keep keep going and check in again in a few years' time. But it is always crucial at a change of circumstances to, to recheck your plan. In a sense, we also need protection from over-information. 
you know, in the press, there is so much on 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 investments in particular, and actually, it's a, an absolute minefield, and we understand that. So, hence, why Bruin has really adapted our services to to enable almost anyone to access financial advice, because we really believe that it's it's crucial in this day and age, especially with our aging population and those dynamics that I talked about at the beginning. Um, so, asking for help is the first step, and uh, and Bruin have designed services to enable for you to do so for online we've got telephone telephone based services and for more bespoke and complex needs we we've got a personal face-to-face -face service or computer to computer service at the moment but we're very much here all 2000 of our staff or so are working at home um, so if you've got any questions please don't hesitate to follow up so that's me i hope i haven't gone too far over uh, but thank you for your time and i'll pass back to sam Lovely. Thank you very much, Fiona. That was, as promised, really insightful. And I thought your, your examples were really good. I'm impressed. So I will move on to talking about the importance of making a will. Um, and I think really to set out that the main importance is to look at what will happen if we don't have a will. And that's when the intestacy rules apply. Um, they're set by statute and they will dictate where, who inherits your estate if you haven't made a will. If uh, you've made a will but it's been invalid and you hadn't made a prior one and if you would made a will but it hadn't been drafted properly so that um, it didn't cover all circumstances so some of your estate could fall into intestacy which is called a partial intestacy. Now who inherits really depends on your own personal circumstances because it depends whether you're married whether you have children and, and who in your family is still alive but I will give you a, a couple of examples. So if you are married and you have children then the first two hundred and seventy thousand pounds of your estate will go to your spouse everything else on top will divide it into two halves your spouse receives one of these halves and your children receive the other equally now if they are younger if they're minor children this does have problems because they receive your estate at 18 which i think well, most people will agree that 18 is very young to receive any sort of capital sum. Um, and it's a young age of financial maturity where people um, aren't really at the stage where they can make considered and um, appropriate decisions perhaps about their finances. But under the intestacy rules, we have no say as to what age our children inherit. The other issue that we have with the intestacy rules is that you can't appoint a guardian. So if you do have minor children, um, it's, you don't have a say as to who will look after them, who will provide that pastoral care. And also you can't choose who your trustees are. It really depends on statute as to who benefits and who therefore acts as your trustees because they're um, linked. But the other main problem, I think, with the intestacy rules is inheritance tax. So if you are married and you have children, um, some part of your estate, depending on the value, may pass to your children and they are non-exempt beneficiaries from inheritance tax. And that means potentially it will be taxable. And I have a case presently that I'm dealing with at the moment. I'm making a statutory will for the father. He's in his late 40s. Um, we're not sure exactly what's happened, but he's in a coma um, and the doctors don't know but he has not got a will. This was because it was revoked by his marriage um, about 14 years ago and, and, and he hasn't made one since. So um, the intestacy rules apply to his estate and it may be that he, he will die um, imminently. So that's why we're making the application to the court. But his estate is worth approximately, his net estate, about 1.6 to 1.7 million. So, his wife will receive the first 270,000. Everything else will be divided into two, which means his children will be receiving approximately 600 to 700,000 pounds. Now, he does have a nil rate band which sets off against um, the assets that his children will receive. So we can deduct 325,000 pounds. We may also deduct a residential nil rate band of 175,000 pounds. But this will mean his children would inherit at 18 part of the family home. But for tax purposes, it may be the best position. So potentially 500,000 pounds could pass tax free. But the balancing 
£200,000 will be taxed at 40%. So on his death, they will need to find £70,000 to pay to the revenue, which is not ideal. But it's also not ideal that his children receive assets at 18 years old when they've got their whole life ahead of them um, to make mistakes like we all do. So um, they receive part of the family home when they're 18, but what happens if they then get married and divorced? Or what happens um, if they're entrepreneurial um, and they, they, they um, make a, 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 I can't speak, something doesn't go well and they become bankrupt? Well, the family home there, in both of those circumstances, is in the financial assessment. So it may mean that their security of residence for the family um, is upset and they have to sell. So making a will um, can get over all of these um, problems, all of these pitfalls. Um, and I think, you know, um, it, it, it's something that people find difficult to get their heads around, but it's something that should be done. And, and many people may decide, well, they will do it at home because they can do it at home. You can get a, a pack from Smith's. Um, but my advice is not to do that because you miss out on the advice that we can give you. Um, I think Fiona said something that I thought was really relevant is that you don't know what you don't know. So when you come to a solicitor, not only do we understand the inheritance tax rules and the way to prepare your will to get the most efficient um, tax perspective for your estate, um, we can also advise about trusts and about ways to protect your estate for your family whether this be by discretionary trust or a life interest which is known as an interest in possession trust those things can all be built in into your will to provide for circumstances such as if you die young and your partner remarries or if you just want to make sure that you've got a ring fence around certain assets um, so that they don't um, are not calculated in the survivor's inheritance tax calculations to, to minimize tax and to be able to claim the residential nil rate ban. Um, because the residential nil rate ban is not something that is automatic like a nil rate ban. You have to claim it and you have to meet certain conditions in order to claim it. Um, for instance, it must be closely inherited and that means it must pass that back, it must pass down to direct descendants. Now that seems like there's no problem. Normally people do want to pass it down to their direct descendants, but as I've said before, normally you, you want to make sure your children inherit at an age where they're more financially mature. So a parent passing their house down on the second death to their children at 25 is no problem. That qualifies for the residential no weight ban. But I've seen many people nowadays where a grandparent actually wants to pass their house down, not to their children, but down to their grandchildren. And this is where we have problems because that type of trust that is created in a will will not qualify for the residential nil rate ban. You would think it should, but under the law, it doesn't. So there's certain things that you do need advice for to make sure your estate benefits um, from the best tax um, perspective. Um, the other thing we need to make sure in your will is that the gifts that you make are valid. Now I'll give you a really good example. Um, well, I think it's a really good example. So um, I have dealt with a will recently that was homemade um, and we had to rectify it because he had left a legacy which says I leave my car to my son now that seems quite straightforward he wanted to leave his car to his son but under the law which has been um, set over many years through cases through case law if you say I leave my car um, to a beneficiary or anything with my at the front the law deems that you are leaving the car that you owned when you drafted your will, not the car that you own when you die. So in this circumstances, he'd made the will 10, 10 years, I think, before he died. And the car that he owned at, his day, at the time of, he made his will, he no longer owned. And so that clause failed and the son did not receive the car. Um, so I was involved to try and um, uh, speak to his siblings to see if he could get other benefit from the will and where they had to agree and we had to do a deed of variation but things like that um, you would think would work but but it actually won't and that's why you need someone to to draft it professionally for you um, i think the other thing that I, I do want to mention is 
the fact that in your will we can capture lots of inheritance tax reliefs. Now I know probably Ryan will talk about this, um, but it's something that we look at when we're, when we're planning your estate, if you do have any assets that qualify for reliefs for inheritance tax, to make sure we, we do get the best tax perspective for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention actually about having a solicitor draft your will is that we will also then store it for you. Now this is really important because if you have your original will at home and on your death we cannot find it, the law says that you're deemed to have revoked it so that whatever in the will doesn't apply and the intestacy rules apply instead or your prior will. However, if it's kept in a solicitor's offices, um, it, it's safe. If we did lose it, um, then we can just say to the court, I'm really sorry, here's a copy of the will and they accept it so that your wishes will stand. So that's one important thing. The second one, which is really important, and I'll highlight with a, with a good example from a case, is that your executors then have the benefit of being able to take advice from a solicitor when they retrieve your original will to get probate. Now, there was a recent case called Myerson where um, the personal representative decided to get probate themselves and it was a taxable estate and there was a, just under £350,000 of tax payable. Now, what he did was he submitted the account to the revenue. There were some mistakes which had to be rectified, which took a bit longer, but he submitted the estate um, and he somehow, the banks had given him access to the monies without the grant of probate, so he hadn't paid the tax. And what he agreed with the beneficiary, who was the son of the deceased, was that the son would pay the tax. So the personal representative gave all of the estate to the son um, on the understanding that he would pay the tax, but the son ran off to Barbados. So now the personal representative is personally liable for £350,000 worth of inheritance tax and they are taking him to court for it. Um, and that obviously would never happen if you had a solicitor because they would make sure the tax was paid, but also um, they have their insurance if they do make a mistake, which hopefully they won't. Um, so let's move on now to um, executing your will during lockdown. So we can still make wills. All of us at the EMG are, are um, working from home, although as you know, I'm in the office today, briefly. Um, we meet people nowadays by video chat through whichever medium that, that you prefer. Um, and, and, and what I have been doing is sending engrossed wills out for people to sign at home. Now, with signing instructions, now um, to make a valid will, your will has to be signed by you in the presence of two independent witnesses who must be 18 years or over and must not be a beneficiary of your will or the spouse of a beneficiary of your will. Now, Witnessing can be more complex in social distancing rules in place, but what I've found is that many people will ask their neighbours to witness, who are not often beneficiaries of their will, um, and they will sign at their front door, and the witnesses can stand outside the appropriate distance away to watch them. Now, the important thing here is that they are in the line of sight, and this is from a case back in the 1800s where a woman went into the solicitor's office to sign her will. She managed to sign it, but then was faint. It, it took a lot out of her. So she had to go and wait in her carriage outside. Um, now, when she died, um, a case was brought against saying the will wasn't valid. And what the court said, and this still stands now, which is amazing, that if she had looked from her carriage window into the solicitor's office, because it was outside the window, she would have seen her witnesses sign. And therefore, if she was in the line of sight, and she could have seen them, the will is valid. So the important thing is line of sight when witnessing wills. So you sign, you step back your two meters, your witnesses come forward and sign, we're all watching um, and it's valid. And, but what I've also been doing is um, calling clients um, when they sign their wills through video chat so I can um, not only help them through the witnessing, which some people you know, find difficult because when you're signing a legal document, you sometimes get a little bit um, nervous, but also it, it makes me feel um, like I'm meeting my duties better because I can see who's there when, when, when things are being signed. So it, it, it helps me in a time when we're in lockdown to make sure that I don't think any undue influence is being um, exerted. But really, wills can still be done, trusts can still be done, so can powers of attorney. We just need to, um, uh, be creative with our witnessing. Um, I mean, I have been to people's houses 
and stayed outside to watch them witness in the local area um, and we are willing to do that and I think now when people do want face-to-face -face appointments we've also set up our offices so we have lovely screens um, we have face masks for people or visors if they want them and lots and lots and lots of hand gel so um, where people do want to see us in person we're ready so thank you very much for listening to me waffle on I will pass on to the lovely Ryan Harrison um, who will give you some excellent advice about tax thank you okay yeah, thanks Sam um... So I'm going to echo a little bit of um, what's already been said today in terms of um, planning and being prepared uh, in, in the sort of current climate um, and how we can therefore protect um, our families and, and protect ourselves in terms of um, tax positions. Um, I'm going to break it down into three areas, I think. So um, first bit, I'm going to do a bit of a background uh, summary as to where we currently are, uh, sort of the financial situation um, from a tax angle. Uh, and, and what it might look like in terms of uh, changes in the near future. Uh, then I'm actually going to sort of drill down into what um, changes we might um, be able to um, plan for or what we might be looking at. Um, some of that is influenced by things that um, we already know about, so um, ongoing consultations um, and reports that have been released prior to COVID um, and, and sort of the background to, to those can influence um, some of our predictions about what, what might change. I'm then going to speculate a little bit about um, sort of high level tax changes that we might see uh, and sort of why and um, what are the consequences of that. And then um, obviously to, to, to end things, I'm going to um, summarise as to what you can do to potentially navigate around the, the landscape that we're in and the future uh, tax changes. All of this is going to sort of be in uh, personal private uh, tax content, so, um, to context. So um, I'll have a look at inheritance tax, capital gains tax, and a little bit of um, income tax as well. I, I think the landscape, as I say, is just is so broad that um, I could pretty much uh, delve into any area um, which, which um, we might see changes um, in the next few months. Uh, but uh, you know, some of it is, my guess, is as good as yours. But equally, I think there are some things that have, have, have grown in uh, have grown in sort of momentum. Uh, and we can make some fairly solid predictions around those. So, as I said, starting things off, um, what's the background? Where, where are we currently? Well, when I wrote um, some piece, um, some notes together to, to speak this morning, uh, at that stage, it looked like we might get a budget at the start of July. Um, and then somebody informed me um, after the weekend, uh, a couple of weeks ago, that, um, that uh, I think on the, on the Friday before the weekend, the uh, government had sort of taken a bit of a um, back step and said, no, there wouldn't be a, an emergency budget. Um, so we're a little bit uncertain as to whether um, th there is going to be something in the summer. I see that um, the sort of shadow um, chancellor and the um, Labour, Labour um, ministers were arguing that we need to have a clear economic package set out in a, um, uh, some form of emergency summer budget. Uh, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen at this stage. Um, yeah, so on that basis, we're looking at an autumn uh, normal budget. Now, even if there is a, an earlier budget, it's likely to focus on economic stimuli. That's uh, another one of the new words that we've all learned this year. Um, and what, uh, what is more likely to appear in that is, is not specific tax changes, but perhaps a front loading of the spend that the government have committed for the next five years in, the, in their um, in their, if it lasts in their um, parliament, uh, and perhaps sort of announcements around what other packages will be available to businesses. I'm not going to go down into too many of those sort of like packages and what's gone on uh, in the past. I, I want to sort of more talk about what's likely to come and more in a wealth protection and planning context. Um, but if anybody's got questions around those, um, specifically around um, COVID um, tax changes or uh, that have already happened, or the packages, as I say, that have already come into play just feel free to um, put those in the question answer or um, I'm happy to speak individually with people um, but I think there'll be a lot of people that are uh, more of an expert in relation to um, some of them than I am um, you know that's the sort of thing that we're typically finding that the word furlough another one we've learned this year um, is it, it's an area of uh, that a lot of people are already well on top of and um, so um, 
what what could we see in economic stimuli? Well, that's a really hard uh, area to, to predict around. I mean, we, we've got some clarity around what it looks like in terms of when the furlough scheme will end, uh, the government uh, loan system and the uh, grants, um, I think, are, are, you know, are all really welcome and they look like they're not disappearing immediately. Um, but clearly there's going to be a black hole in the um, sort of ch um, Chancellor's um, checkbook and his his budget. So. Uh, the FT reported that we've got something like a 337 billion um, uh, gap in uh, um, in spend in terms of <clears throat> um, what what's gone on and and the um, where we are to date really in, in terms of how much has been spent and the problem we've got is that nobody really knows um, when when this ends. Equally, some of the measures that have been brought in deferments for July payments on account, VAT deferments there's no certainty that they will ever be recovered. So the government are offering deferrals and the revenue are, are offering deferrals, but in reality, will that money ever be recouped? Um, and unfortunately, the economic situation around unemployment and businesses failing will only add to the, um, the ongoing cost. Uh, and, and that's why it's, it's evident to everybody that we've, we've got this contraction in the economy and um, the um, likely overall 8% um, estimated um fall uh in terms of what what it could look like so um you know it's it's clearly a crisis that we we're still living through so some of the some of the things that i'm going to say here are, are somewhat speculative um when the um government came to power they've had a i'm sure many people have heard of they've had a triple lock in terms of uh three taxes that they've said that they won't change bat national insurance and income tax and um, that feels under threat um perhaps not around VAT, but certainly around national insurance and income tax. And and therefore, you know, they may go against the word in terms of not altering those taxes. Um, against all of that, um, what are HMRC doing? And I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it, as opposed to concentrating on sort of the news headlines around the government. Let's look at what HMRC are doing. Well, HMRC are currently rec recruiting. Um, they've been working reduced hours. They've always had a sort of flexi time uh, system, but they're, they're sort of, they've pushed that like anybody, any other business at present. Uh, and it's increasingly hard to contact them. Now, the reason I'm bringing all these points up is because um, what they're gearing up for, and that is being uh, reported on in the press, is that they're gearing up for a likely um, increase in the amount of um, inquiries, likely increase in the amount of um, refusals of clearance applications, uh, and and so on and, and and ways that they can potentially um, increase the tax take for the government. And interestingly, there's a couple of sort of clippets of news that I've I've read which are worth sharing with you. Um, one is that um, there was a digital services tax which came in in April, went under the radar, uh, which is a sort of like an international tax. And HMRC have actually recruited some of the Microsoft to. Um, to implement that and to work through the systems. So they're clearly gearing themselves up uh, to, to really, um, to try and uh, sort of get ahead of the curve and, and start to, um, you know, be, be more potentially more punitive, unfortunately. And, and I think we will see, um, we will see some more um, aggressive sort of actions by the revenue. You know, it's been clear to us that monitoring case law, obviously there's been a, um, there's, there's a lull at the minute, but when you look at the cases that were um, being picked up on and running into March, um, there are certain areas that the revenue are quite keen to inquire into. So entrepreneurs relief, which changed in April, um, there's, a, there's a whole lot of cases emerging around that. Uh, and equally, um, we're increasingly seeing a lot of uh, capital gains tax cases around principal private residents. So there's certain areas that they can, they, they can clearly home in on. Um, and in the background, there's been an ongoing review which started a couple of weeks ago in relation to certain uh, tax reliefs and um, that um, the government and the revenue perceive to be a bit too generous and one of those is is the tax relief around your main home so you know they've had tweaks around that what will they do to to enforce it further and um, i'll come on to that shortly so um i, I think that leaves us in a, in a bit of an uncertain position and, and all we can do is we can look at what um what currently exists guess to a certain extent what might change based on information that we have and then start to put plans in place to protect ourselves and our family as i say and you know having a will a valid will that's drafted uh, in recognition of current tax law is is one very very um 
very, very good bit of advice that anybody should take. Equally, um, putting in place a financial plan, um, as um, Fiona has mentioned and alluded to, and, and, and using our basic allowances, ISA allowance, uh, considering our pension uh, position, um, pension contributions, and equally um, simply using our capital gains annual exemption are just really, really good sound advice that we should all be considering at present. Um, so the, the sort of Nostradamus bit, what, what could change? Well, um, I, I think one area of um, particular concern, and, and I think really is a bit of a slam dunk, is, is certainly around national insurance. Um, Rishi Sunak said uh, at one of his early announcements that you know, he would look to align national insurance rates i.e. a potential increase for um, self-employed in terms of the rates that they pay. Uh, and I think there's a, a growing sense that um, co companies um, that are used as a way of sheltering sort of um, PAYE, uh, i.e. Um, consultants, etc., who operate by companies, will, will feel a bit of a pinch. IR35, which comes in next year after being deferred, um, has, has been this, this long-winded process to, to get people paying um, what the revenue perceived to be a fairer share of tax. And, and I think we're, we're likely to see um, a potential increase in national insurance rates for both um, employees, self-employed and employers. Um, and that is a very, very easy way for the, for the revenue to, um, to, to increase their tax take. Uh, it applies across all taxes. There was a really peculiar um, public uh, announcement that the revenue, really, revenue released a couple of weeks ago, about 10 days ago. Happy to share it with anybody if they want to see it. And it was almost like a policy um, statement, civil service type statement, saying that um, they want people to pay their fair share of, of tax and that the easiest way to do that is under PYE. And some of those comments that they included were quite concerning. Uh, and, and I think around that piece in terms of um, um, our... The, the tax take on a monthly basis and, and, and the, the fact that the, the vast majority of the population pay under PAYE and the, and the way the furlough scheme has operated has really demonstrated that, um, you know, in an ideal world, the move towards digitalization, et cetera, et cetera, the government and the revenue would really like as many people as possible to be paying their tax on a monthly basis and, and via PAYE is the easiest way to collect it. Making tax digital um, was, a, was a way of trying to bring in self-assessment sort of non-PAYE taxpayers onto that system. But I think we're gonna see a real drive towards that. Um, you know, if, if the government want um, people to be supported via furlough, um, they equally want people to pay their fair amount of tax on a monthly basis. And, um, and, I, and I think, you know, the national insurance rise and, um, and sort of changes around that area are, are likely to come in. Um, and plain and simple, that is, that is, that is the biggest amount of um, a tax take for the, for the revenue, income tax and national insurance by far um, the biggest uh, win in terms of collecting taxes. Now, in terms of capital taxes and protection, I think we can make some more, um, some more um, solid, um, solid, predictions about what might happen. Firstly, in relation to capital gains tax, um, we've had quite an attractive rate of 20% around for a while, 10% um, on returns relief. Um, and um, you know, that, 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 that has been um, in place for a time, a period where um, really, you know, it's, I think people have started to, to get wise to the fact that it's not gonna be there forever. Uh, and that was one of the reasons for shrinking the entrepreneur's relief allowance uh, in, a, in the budget earlier this year. And um, the fact that we had a budget in March just seems bizarre now. Um, and um, I think a, a likely increase in capital gains uh, tax main rate is, 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 a, is, a, is a good guess, good, good guess as any. Um, currently, we have a 28% rate for residential property. Will they align that sort of 28% rate or will, will we see an increase to say 30%? I, I, think, I think they're, they're, they're worthwhile um, considerations uh, and, and therefore sort of making gifts using your annual exemption are so key at the minute and trying to lock in the lower rate of capital gains tax is, is, a, is, a, is a sensible, um, sensible planning exercise. Um, as I said before, alluded to principal private residence relief, um, that's a hugely valuable relief, cost the exchequer a lot of money. Will they tighten that up further? We've had a reduction in the period of time uh, between um, when you move out of a property and when you can sell. Uh, it's now down to nine months, so everybody's sort of got this maximum nine-month period following, the, um, following moving out of a property to sell. In the current climate, that's going to be quite hard to, to adhere to, I, I assume, uh, with the property market very unpredictable. Um, and therefore, um, you know, that creates a lot of challenges. But I think, again, you know, there's enough rumours, there's enough evidence in case law that they're looking to tighten up around that. 
what will that mean? Really hard to say, um, but it might tie in some form of inheritance tax. So um, a lot of the inheritance tax predictions that I can make um, are broadly around the um, reports that we had, um, two reports in the last um, 18 months, uh, which were conducted by the Office of Tax Simplification, which is a separate government body. And both of those um, centered around two things. So, so the, the first report was all about um, how they would digitalize inheritance tax or how they could um, improve the inheritance tax reporting system, get away with sort of the old forms and could they make things more online. And then the second report was more around specific changes to inheritance tax. And what they looked at there and, and, and what the key message is, is that they're trying to tighten up a lot around a lot of the uh, exemptions that are available, the ones that Sam alluded to in terms of drafting your will. So um, we've got these old, very old sort of 1986, I think when IHC was released, um, type 250 pounds, small gift exemptions, 3,000 pound a year annual exemption, normal expenditure out of income, the ongoing monthly amount that you can sort of, or, or periodic amount that you can give to somebody. And, and, and a lot of those are under threat as a consequence of this review. It looks like we might get sort of like a one broad amount that everybody could give away each year, in addition to their nil rate band. Um, which, which they sort of worked out around a figure of sort of 25,000. Um, but that in itself um, might restrict a lot of people who are trying to do uh, more sizable planning, um, you know, and, and trying to make use of the exemptions that are currently available. It, it, again, is really good planning, re really uh, proactive um, advice. And um, uh, sort of what was mentioned in, within those reports is that they're looking to tighten up around business property relief, agricultural property relief, to really, really valuable exemptions within the inheritance tax legislation. Sam mentioned before, you, you can use those within your will. You can use those within lifetime. Uh, and again, if you've got assets that fall within those categories or um, you're advising people with assets within those categories, you really need to be looking at should, should we be crystallizing them as far as possible now as opposed to waiting to, to a change which might come in the autumn when the budget's announced. Um, you know, in the current climate, there's absolutely uh, nothing stopping the um, government sort of doing these snap changes. And whilst there's a consultation procedure that's meant to follow, um, unfortunately, they didn't really strictly follow it in terms of what changed with Entrepreneurs Relief in April. That set a precedent. There's the, the, the Tax Institute, which I'm a member of, are, are sort of challenging the government around that, saying that, you know, you have to follow legislative guidelines around introducing new rules. But unfortunately, you know, I think that the, the playing field has changed. And, you know, it, if, if they want to change um, some of those exemptions, we could just see a snap change. Um, the big, the big one around inheritance tax and capital gains tax is um, is the elephant in the room, which is a capital levy, uh, which which hopefully won't make too many people fall off their seats. But um, yeah, there is a concern that um, we might see some form of one-off um, wealth tax levied on everybody's estates. Now that's something that apparently exists in a few um, countries. I know Norway, for example, has that. I've done some sort of background reading as to what it to look like, and um, we had a a conference recently with uh, tax council uh, who, who advise uh, the government and the revenue and, and, and they, they sort of main take on point around this is it would be a really hard tax to implement because it, it's a completely new tax. It would go against a lot of what um, we have in, play, in place at present and it would be really, really unpopular. Uh, it would have some serious design faults as well because how do you, how do you impose a tax like that when um, you know, the, the people that would, would suffer it are likely to be um, those um, in and around in retirement, those who have built up a large estate. You know, d is it levied on the, the, the family home or do you get an exemption like for inheritance tax around the family home? Is it levied on cash? Yes, that would be an easy asset to levy on. But is it levied on ISIS? Is it levied on um, cars and uh, uh, vehicles and assets and how are those valuations conducted and would it be self-assessed and our system is all around self-assessment so it would be extremely difficult to implement now against that i've read a couple of things saying well actually you know it might not be as hard to implement as, as we as we see because the government and, and the revenue have been slowly improving their digitalization of um, information you know they have a lot more information at their hands as a consequence of connect which is their big supercomputer as I mentioned, that they're, they're, they're recruiting people from Microsoft. You know, they're trying to use um, the powers and the, the technology that's available to us that we've all become familiar with um, as a consequence of working from home or, or COVID. So, um, you know, th th there is a concern that they do have the powers to implement it, but the actual design of it would be so um, difficult. And I think under the current government, it, it, it would be a, 
a really uh, a negative um, backlash. Um, but but unfortunately, you know, so somebody will have to pay for the, for these um, for the for the sort of black hole that we've got uh, in the economy. And um, you know, I, it, I I don't foresee it personally, but it's it's definitely something to to be aware of. Um, so yeah, the, the only other couple of mentions in terms of what might change i think it's perhaps vat there's been a growing i've read a couple of articles recently a growing momentum around you know in 2008 we lowered the rate of vat would that happen again to sort of generate sales and uh, almost like an a, a, a economic change a stimuli um you know i think that is yeah i think that is is potential uh, to happen but in, in 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 reality you know it's more about increasing tax take and lowering vat it doesn't doesn't necessarily do that and it's trying to get the balance between lowering uh, VAT but increasing um, activity and um, so, so again that's something to monitor um, one thing again that I read over the weekend was that the revenue in terms of um, capital taxes inheritance tax are seeing their uh, greatest ever um, claim for inheritance tax refunds as a consequence of the fall in share prices so and um, you know there are areas that the revenue are going to try and kick back on or resist on because you know they, they themselves will, will see payouts not just as a consequence of the um, sort of economic package that we've got and um, self-employment grants and uh, furlough, but also um, purely as a consequence of um, people using the tax legislation to their benefit. And um, so, really, you know, to conclude, that the simple part is. There, there are so many things that you could be considering now and people should be considering now uh, to plan in terms of their estates. You know, it, you would be living in a hole to suggest that there aren't going to be tax changes. Whilst they might not come over the summer, I think in the autumn we will certainly see a, a move towards increases in tax, taxation and, and ways to collect tax. You know, will they get rid of um, the higher rate tax relief on pensions? Potentially. Um, is that then a good time to think about making now a good time to think about making pension release absolutely pension contributions absolutely you know if you're in a position to, to to do that certainly could they be you know they don't have to be personal pension contributions company pension contributions equally attractive uh, and that's where you know getting the right advice uh, speaking to, to fiona and rob and, and, and uh, Bruin, you know that that's the sort of action that people should be thinking about um and and really you know with, there's so many things that could change that now is as good a time as any to be to be planning for the future uh, and making decisions to protect protect your estates and protect your own uh, own, own wealth um, and 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 really just just keep an eye out for for changes we hopefully this week um we'll have an article going to press around some speculation including some of the comments that i've mentioned on the on the um webinar today and um, i think that will be published in the journal uh, and in some other areas so happy to share that that with people if they'd like to read around thoughts and again if anybody's got questions now i think we're all going to sort of um uh stay around and turn our uh, mics on and um, so people can add questions into the the, the forum at the side and, and uh, we'll try and answer them as best we can uh, hope everyone found that really useful as well Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ryan. I thought that was really, really interesting. And mm. um, yes, if anyone does have any questions, like Ryan says, there's a tab at the bottom in the centre um, that you click on and you add your question, press enter, and we'll do our best to answer, answer you. But I think one of the things that I thought while you write questions, if you have any, is um, Ryan made a really interesting risk, an interesting point about Notre Dame. And it reminded me um, last night when I said to my son, I said, um, will you stay in your own bed tonight, please? And he said, mum, I can't see the future. So, you know, we can't see the future, but I think the thing that we need to do is to take that advice so that we can um, plan as best as we can um, with the information that we have, um, because we can build in flexibility for people in both in lifetime investments, in tax and, and in your estate planning. Um, I don't have any questions yet. Yeah. Um, can ask questions among ourselves. So, um, yes, have you got any questions? <laughs> <laughs> no. I think equally. I just want to say that I want. I want to just say thank you to both Ryan and Sam because I think you know 
They were really, really good updates and insights um, and, and using examples. And, and it, it is really the here and now that we are having to, to plan for. I think so often you can delay planning. And as Ryan said, you know, now is as good a time as any um, because we, we know what the situation is at the moment. We don't know what the future will hold. Um, it's always good to plan ahead. And if anybody's got, um, don't necessarily need to put them on this forum, but if anybody's got um, sort of questions uh, that they want to ask on email or by phone, I'm happy to um, to do it that in that manner as well. Um, and sort of try and keep people updated uh, in terms of uh, when we start to hear more announcements. Uh, it's just very, very hard to predict, I guess, at the minute. Uh, we just got to, yeah, as Fiona says, just echoing that. You've really got to get ahead of it now um, and start thinking about, you know, what, what what your estate looks like and what um, protection you might need and um sort of making the most of the reliefs that are available um you know and there are ways to crystallize a lot of those reliefs now um you know not 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 necessarily just waiting to to hear announcements i think it was quite topical ryan the the bit that you mentioned about the the loss relief on estates for inheritance tax because i've just had an example like that um but i think it's just worth making the point that there are obviously restrictions. The, the sales have to take place within a year of death. So probate has to be granted, but the executors still have to, to place the sales. It all has to take place within a year. So whilst the relief is available, you know, if probate is taking slightly longer, then it, it, you, you can potentially lose it. But um, yeah, that, that is a relief that people probably weren't necessarily aware of while markets have been going up. Yeah. But now yes. obviously things have slightly changed. It's nice to hear that you've had that. Well, some, somewhere it's nice to see that, um, you know, it, it, sometimes you read something and you think, is that, is that in, in reality happening? And I think what we're finding is that, unfortunately, the revenue aren't being that lenient. Um, you know, they'll be lenient around sort of deadlines and dates for things potentially or, or, or accepting, non, um, accepting PDF electronic signatures. But in terms of um, sort of, you know, making claims and things like that, if, if there's any doubt about whether it being available, you know, unfortunately, at the minute, they seem to be drawing the conclusion that um, the answer is no. Uh, and I think that's partly because there are a lot of them working from home, the inspectors. Um, so they're not consulting with um, colleagues. They're sort of making decisions under pressure uh, in their own home, like, like all of us. And, and, and we're finding that, you know, that they won't answer the phone. You can't speak to inspectors. And that in itself creates a real, real difficulty because we're, we, we would like to have consultation and discussions. You know, it's much, you know, it's very, very simple, um, psychology isn't it you know speaking to people you often find is you get a much better sense of what's going on but actually um you know dealing with the revenue purely by correspondence is horrendous because you know they will just say what they want we even had a case recently where we put a complaint in uh, about the handling of the, uh, of the matter and the um, individual who was dealing with that um, that correspondence assessed their own complaint so they assessed their own performance in terms of the complaint and responded they didn't pass it for independent review or anything they just came back saying that they thought that their own standards were upheld and uh, that was the end of the matter which is pretty outrageous um but it just demonstrates you know how important it is um you know to, to sort of get advice and to get ahead of things um i think yeah, there'll be a lot of people I, that yeah miss it unfortunately no i agree with you although i have just had a successful loss relief claim which went fine actually good but, um i don't think there was any difficulty with it um so, yeah. Well, I don't think perhaps people have any questions if that's the case, do you think? Oh, so one question coming. Oh, you're right. After I said that. What are the so, rules? And thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, well, what are the rules and any implications of gifting cash to children before death? So, um, Cash gifts um, are um, outside the scope of capital gains tax, which is quite useful. I mentioned about um, uh, the fact that um, uh, capital gains tax rates might change. So, so, so that in itself, we can immediately discount um, um, uh, ca uh, capital gains tax. Inheritance tax, um, so cash, cash gifts are um, treated as a potentially exempt transfer um, for inheritance tax purposes. Um, and um, depending on the quantum, the amount involved um, may fall within some of the basic allowances which are currently available that I alluded to. So you have this small gift exemption so that everybody can give away 250 quid um, to, to children or to, to anybody they like. They can then also give away 3,000 pounds in addition, which is an annual exemption amount, um, but that's, that's fixed in total for the taxpayer. Uh, 
amounts beyond that are then started eating into your um, available inheritance tax nil rate band. So that's 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 capped at three hundred twenty-five thousand. Um, but but there's no um, there's no limit on how much you can give in terms of cash gifts. So you could give as much as you wanted to children if you've survived seven years. Uh, there'd be no inheritance tax comeback. Um, if um, death occurred after making a gift within seven years, then you need to consider you would consider it at that point uh, on death. And um, you know, so, so so making a cash gift is is good planning uh, in lifetime, excellent. But also considering sort of the what reliefs you might be offsetting against that is equally good planning. Um, Sam, do you want to add a couple of points around that? I just wanted to add for the annual exemption. Yes, we can give three thousand pounds per person every tax year. But if you haven't given your annual exemption the year before, you can also give that in one year. So you could give six thousand pounds away in one year. And also, if we are making large cash gifts, um, if they are, if so, if they're under the nil rate band and you die within the seven years, it will utilise the appropriate part of your nil rate band. So if you give two hundred thousand pounds, it will utilise two hundred thousand pounds of your nil rate band, so that you only have one hundred twenty-five thousand pounds to set off against the rest of your estate. But if you give over the nil rate band, so say if you gave three hundred fifty thousand pounds away and you died within the seven years. You've utilised all of your nil rate band, and the twenty-five thousand pounds over and above your nil rate band will be charged to tax at forty percent, and your child will be responsible for paying that tax. Now, if you die very shortly after the gift, it's forty percent, but it does taper down the longer you survive the gift. Um, I think that's all I wanted yeah, the, to say. Yeah, I think, I think that's yeah. a good point to make. That it is the recipient of the gift that would then be liable for the inheritance tax not not necessarily the estate now the recipient may be a beneficiary of the estate but it's just worth noting that on a potentially exempt transfer like that should the uh, person making the gift die within seven years then the person receiving the gift would be liable for the inheritance tax so that's one of the areas that at, at Bruin Dolphin we do look at where people have made made large gifts and possibly putting some sort of protection in place to to cover that uh, that potential inheritance tax liability yeah, and I think that's really good protection because I have seen it where a large gift was made, the children didn't have the cash to pay the tax, and so the, 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 the surviving spouse wanted to pay it from their monies. But that was also a gift because, you, yes, they're paying the tax, but it's the children's responsibility. So that payment of tax is a gift for them by inheritance tax purposes. And if they didn't survive that gift by seven years, then it's going to be taxed double. So it's, 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 it's a good idea to have that protection in place if you are making large capital gifts to children in life. And then the only other thing to And am I right in thinking that, um, that there's equally the excess gift uh, of excess income? So on, on top of the, the £3,000 and the £250, um, a pr a pr on, the, on the understanding that you're giving it regularly and it is excess income, so it's not infringing on your um, standard of living, you are able to gift yeah. excess cash. That, that's right, Ryan. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's a, that's the point I was going to add, Fiona. Yeah, so yeah, that's, <laughs> that would that would be the sensible planning. Um, so if you were making a cash gift and you had ex, you could potentially demonstrate you had excess income. That's that's how you play it out. Um, you try and do it as a sort of periodic gift. It could be monthly. Could it give, could even be annually. Uh, you've just got to be able to support it with the income, and you've got to be mindful of the fact. I think I mentioned it is that you know that that might be removed that exemption, and um, so you'd want yeah. to try and do it now, start it now because the, the first gift can actually qualify, and um, so that would take it completely out of the side of the scope of tax. You'd get rid of any cash, uh, any capital gains. So say it's not an issue, and then you'd also get rid of the inheritance tax issue. The only other thing to note was, was sort of covering every single base is if, if that cash <laughs> is used for the benefit of the uh, you know you can't the cash has to be you know a gift to be a valid gift has to be cut and dry a gift there's no um this sort of has to be made yeah, and, and, yeah. yeah. and one, one minor point again if we've said this 3000 exemption if if it's a joint gift say husband and wife making the gift and obviously they can both claim that exemption and if they've not used it the year before they both have the the six thousand so you know you could potentially offset twelve thousand against the, the large gift to start with so again just the, there's, there's ways and means of just um doing simple planning to make use of these these reliefs
Yeah, can I say one more thing about gifts out of um, excess income? Just to say that it's really important to establish a pattern of giving and give evidence that this is what you're intending to doing, even if it's just an email to, to me or your solicitor or to Ryan or Fiona setting out that this is your intention because we have to uh, prepare a case for the revenue to accept that they're gifts out of income. And they are very hard on cases because they don't want them all to go through. They want to be able to charge tax. So having that evidence that it's your intention to do so is really important as well. Definitely, yeah, good record keeping is essential. Brilliant, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Well, I think that is, that was the uh, only question. Is that right or has one appeared again? No, that is the only question. So um, thank you ever so much, Ryan and Fiona and Rob. Um, for all of your for all of your insight um, and, for, and for joining us on the seminar it's, I think it's been really interesting and I hope everyone has enjoyed it um, and if you do have any questions please feel free to email or telephone any of us um, and we'll, we'll do our best to help thanks a lot Sam thanks Fiona. thank you Sam okay. thank you